Good afternoon, everyone. You know, it's getting kind of late, so uh, hopefully we'll have something that we'll you know, energize the group with this afternoon and have some, a good session here. Uh, and as David mentioned, uh, this is the emerging trend for the government. Uh, and one of the things that we're trying to do as part of this, we're not going to do our standard PowerPoint presentations that the agency have done at the, at, at the other conventions and conferences that we've attended. Really to try to create some dialogue between you and the agencies of what they're doing, where they're going, and take this as a more of a town hall session that we promoted, trying to get some feedback about what they're, you know, what we're doing, what we're doing well, where we can partner, and the things of data acquisition, um, you know, access to information, dissemination of information, changing business models. So uh, we have a very distinguished panel this afternoon. And uh, I have Mr. John Moore, uh, sorry, Bob Morris from the Library of Congress. I'm fortunate to have uh, Bob here today. Uh, he wasn't on the program, a uh, last minute edition, but we're glad to have him here this afternoon. Uh, you know, uh, the Library of Congress Map and Chart Division has a long history with the association. Uh, it's good that they're back, and I think Bob will have quite a few things to share with us this afternoon. If you were in Washington two years ago, you might remember the presentation by John Ager. He was the director of the Map and Chart Division. And he did an excellent presentation on some of the new acquisitions. And one thing I remember, there was one of our European members mentioned something about the map that we had bought, uh, that we added to the, uh, the collection. And I don't know. We'd stolen it. I think that's right, Charlie. I, I can't remember who that was. Maybe it was Hans, but uh, hopefully. Uh, we stole it. <laughs> So, but uh, again, uh, great presentation, great to have Library of Congress here in Bob this afternoon. Uh, Mike Cooley is with the U.S. Geological Survey. He's our U.S. Topo Program Manager, and he'll be talking about that, the trends and changes. Uh, Connie Beard from the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, she'll be talking about their change in program. And Dr. Uh, Bill Krausman, who is with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service. So we have him this afternoon in the Southwest region. And finally, John Hanna from the state BLM office here. So again, uh, you know, I think we have a great panel this afternoon, and I think it will be enjoyable. Uh, how we're going to do this, we're going to give them a little bit of time to get a background and share where their, their programs and agencies are going and the changes, and then open it up for a question and answer. Again, we'd like to take away from you what's working, what's not working. You know, get some feedback. Uh, these big folks are going to try to take it back to their programs and their agency folks and see how it can influence those things in the future. It might also tie into some of the discussion about the future of the association, where it's going, because the government definitely has interest of where this association is going in our, in our partnership with it. With that, I'm going to have Bob go ahead and introduce himself and talk about what the Library of Congress is doing. Thank you all. I, uh, uh, I'm going to assume that you're all familiar with the Library of Congress, but uh, we are. Uh, the largest li uh, library in the world. Within the Library of Congress, there's the largest map library in the world, and it's the Geography Map Division where I work. Uh, we, we say we have about 5.5 million cartographic items and in, in counting. Uh, we've been collecting for, uh, actually, since the, uh, since the first Congress, or the first map library was burned up by the British in the War of 1812. Uh, and we depended on, the, on uh, Thomas Jefferson to sell us his collection of maps and books to, to begin building the Library of Congress again. But that's a little bit of, of, of history. Um, we are uh, somewhat bucking a library trend and that libraries around the nation are seeing uh, an in increase in visitation, whereas the Library of Congress has seen a decrease. Uh, the principal reason for that, uh, although there's a, there's a host of them, the principal reason is, is we're putting more of our content uh, online. Anything that's uh, out of copyright, or we have the permission of the copyright holder to post, we're doing so. Uh, that's books, and in the uh, you know, important case of the Geography and Mount Division, we have over 40,000 images that are uh, posted online. The vast majority, as I, I mentioned, are out of copyright, or, or we have the permission from the copyright holder to post them. Uh, cottage industries have uh, developed because you can go, view those, download them, totally free of charge and manipulate them any way you want or repackage them and sell them. And, uh, that's very much what's being done. We're, uh, we're always looking for uh, new areas. We, we largely uh, concentrate on our historical maps and, and uh, defined uh, 
quantities to, to pose right now. We're, uh, after we finish the Civil War uh, maps, we did American Revolutionary War maps, and now we're doing somewhat of a unique uh, type of American cartography, and that is land ownership maps that were done uh, by, by private industry rather than by local governments. Uh, we're working on, working on that as I, as I speak. Another thing we're doing is we're, we're partnering with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, and we're, we're trying to get a, a complete census of all, of all quads that were ever, ever produced, revisions, additions, uh, and those are going to be, uh, going to be put online, uh, allowing us to free up some very much-needed space in our, in our collections. Uh, and those will be posted, I think, but I'll, I'll let uh, USGS speak a little bit more about that. A new project that we're starting on, and, and I guess I, let me mention first that the way we've grown our collections is, is a number of ways. We, we, we purchase maps, we depend on other government agencies, both federal, local, and state, to deposit maps. We depend on government agencies to transfer no longer needed maps to us. Uh, we depend on copyright registration as well as mandatory deposit. Uh, we have foreign exchange programs with foreign governments, although those are only by the wayside. But what I want to mention uh, mostly is uh, we, we depend on donations. Uh, donations have uh, been a large part over the years and it will, will continue to be a large part of the way we, we, uh, we grow our collections. I know, uh, having sat through the uh, previous session and speaking to many of you, uh, your, your business model, sales, uh, uh, always an interest in creating interesting products is important, but uh, assuming that uh, you all want to be somewhat immortal. Um, one way to uh, to do that is to have uh, uh, the, the, the fruits of your, your efforts, your, what, what you've created, um, live on. And one way to do that, a pretty safe way to do that, is to uh, deposit it at the Library of Congress. Uh, I, I started out my career as a reference librarian, and I can't tell you how many great-granddaughters or grand grandsons that were practically in tears with uh, seeing a pristine copy of a, of a Civil War map that uh, made its way to the library and was properly preserved. And they'd only heard of it, they'd never seen a copy. So uh, we, would, uh, we would try and make it as easy as possible for you to every now and then think about uh, packaging uh, some one copy of your material and, and uh, deposit it in the library so uh, future generations could, uh, could possibly enjoy it. On that, uh, with that idea, uh, and we're not, I mentioned Civil War and earlier, we've had to move forward a little bit and uh, we have now have a project where we're, we're contacting some of the initial participants in the creation of GIS. Uh, ESRI obviously figures into that, uh, that dynamic, but there's a number of individuals, uh, mathematics professors uh, at, at Harvard and so forth, back in the even, believe it or not, in the late 50s and 60s that we are getting in contact with, and they are agreeing to deposit their personal archives. So we're going to somewhat uh, document the, the history of the development of GIS at the library. Um, another, another project that we're, uh, we're working on is, is moving away from, uh, with, with the Copyright Office, moving away from making the hard copy document the, the, uh, the deposit item of choice. Your, uh, Creators are going to be able to uh, deposit the, the digital data, the, the digital form, and, uh, and, and that certainly will make it a lot easier in the future. Uh, so we're moving away. E-books, e-deposits is, is very much a trend that's that's emerging. Uh, one, one other one other area where we're, where we're focusing on is the continent of Africa. I think it's probably pretty safe safe to say almost every other continent, with it, maybe the exception of Antarctica has been mapped, completely mapped, and mapped uh, numerous times. Uh, that's, that's probably not true of Africa. So we've taken our 300,000 sheet series collection and we're uh, documenting what we hold with the, with the hope of uh, putting all that uh, online and uh, with, with people being able to contact us and say, we have a, a sheet, we apparently have a sheet or a number of sheets that you do not hold with the idea of possibly uh, um, growing the, uh, the geographic knowledge, including the historical geographic uh, uh, knowledge of, uh, of the continent of Africa going back to colonial times up to, up to the present. Um, I 
think uh, I'll end there. But, uh, that uh, gives you an idea of some of, some of, of, of where we're headed. But it largely, it is trying to put our collections online and, and create a, a library without walls has, has been largely our, our focus. I have a question for you. Go ahead, we can take questions. Okay. How do you want, you, you were just talking earlier, and you said, Ty, can you send a bunch of your, haven't have received anything in, or three years, and I produce a lot of things in the United States here, and you want me to deliver it to you as a PDF? Um. Because let's say you need to pull, pull that map, put it in that box, ship it to you. Do you want me to send it as a PDF? You don't have to, you know? Let, let me give, give back to you on that. Am I too early? You, in a way, you're, you're, you're too early. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we, we, will, we, will, we will head there. But maybe this, uh, uh, this first generation, since it's been a number of years, I, I would say uh, let's go hard copy initially. But uh, there, there's the issue of we are a library and we have to be able to, 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 to readily serve it also to our, to our patrons. So, to solve that hurdle first. Now, I have, I have a number of, um, quote, we, we, I publish on paper. I have a bunch of product that's never been published on paper. It is a piece of artwork. They never made it. And I don't know if they'll ever make it or not. Is that interesting? Yes. Because uh, I don't know if it, I don't know if it'll ever go out. Because the market demand, you know, it might happen, but it might not happen. A large portion of our collections are, are, are manuscript or what you would call pre-publication uh, prints, and uh, it gives it gives uh, a researcher, an academic, an idea of what was in, in the in, uh, in the 20, early 21st century, the, the, the process that went that a, that a map producer, that a publisher would go through to create an end product. So definitely. Do we have any other questions for, for Bob? All right, as introduced, my name is Michael Cooley. I am the product manager for the U.S. Topo Project for the U.S. Geological Survey. And we also have Greg Allen here today, who is the product manager for the historic map. So if there's any questions that come up on our historic map, I guess I'll refer those to Greg. He's, <coughs> excuse me, he's really the expert in that. Um, the other thing I guess I'd like to say is I'm going to give a real quick kind of five, seven minute kind of synopsis of my program. I'm going to focus more on where we're going, but then most of you know kind of where we've been and what we're doing now. Um, there's some fact sheets over there, the one page descriptions about my program, Greg's program, and some of the major programs that the USGS has going on. As kind of stated, we started in 2009 with the US Topo project at that time. It was called Digital Map Beta. That was our introductory year. We've been going on for about three years now. We are going into our second year of revision. Starting the next year, 2013, we'll actually start remapping those estates and U.S. topos that we did in 2010. So I think it's big news for us. Basically, the U.S. topo is a digital product. We moved away from storing it as a paper product at USGS in the warehouse. Most of you already know this. It's a GeoPDF format. Um, it's electronically available free on the web. So those are some of the major characteristics about it. Right now, we produce, we're on a three-year revision cycle, um, originally designed following the game program. Um, we're doing about 18,000 maps. We're finishing, like I said, the continental U.S. this year. At the end of this year, we're going to start Hawaii. We're actually having problems with imagery over the main uh, island of Hawaii. Hope to get it started. Puerto Rico is going to get done early next year. Same problem in Puerto Rico. Um, we're going to start Alaska in 2013. We hope to start Alaska probably about the third quarter. The big kicker with Alaska is the communities up there. One is to go to a much larger scale. So we're going to be moving from 63,000 to 360 to a 1 to 25,000. There's approximately 12,000 maps up there that we're going to be mapping. 
2013, we're hoping to get about 400 done. And then we'll step it up in the out years. Again, if you want to know anything about it, we have some descriptions on our web page, um, specifics about what we're looking at doing. <clears throat> so with that, some of where we're going in the U.S. Topo in the future. Um, starting in 2013, we're going to introduce some redesign of the graphic. When we originally kicked the map off, we continued we purposely kept some of the same symbology based upon what the, the GIS systems or map production systems at the time could support. We knew there was going to be a problem showing those symbologies over again. So the US Topo is a huge product as well as a topographic map product. So next year we're going to start introducing some of the redesigned some symbologies. We're going to add shaded relief. We're going to continue that feature that we have. So, sorry, so some of the features that we're going to be adding are the, uh, more boundaries, national park boundaries, fish and wildlife, and military boundaries. We're going to add a shaded relief component to it, and we're going to change some of the, they call it transparencies, and some of the other features that we're showing. Again, it's going to be a gradual introduction of it. It's not going to be a radical change at first, but we'll continue to change that over time. One of the long-term goals of the U.S. Topo, right now it's a semi-automated process. I have about 20 people working on this. Each map is individually looked at before it's finalized. The ultimate goal is to move it to the web fully automation. That's my goal. I'm not sure if we're going to achieve it in the next three years, but that's what I'm trying to challenge our production centers to do. A lot of it's going to depend upon the quality of our data going into it. So there's still going to be some data prep when we get the data ready for that production. Once we do that, then the other thing that we're going to be looking at is offer it in other formats besides GeoPDF. At this time, I can't tell you what some of the other formats are going to be, but there will be formats that you can be able to take an adjustment to a GIS system. The other major change is going to be moving it from a one third of the country or 18,000 maps a year to what I call change in the landscape. So we we'll revise the graphics based upon the need of the provision where we get new LIDAR data, new elevation data, new hydrographic data. Those will be some of the drivers that will help us revise our program. Other drivers will be based on what we're calling our communities of use. We're kind of changing the way we're listening to our, our key users of our program, and so we're going to revise our graphics based upon the input from those communities. So with all this said, we've made a lot of progress in the last four years. I know for some of you it's been kind of difficult because we're moving from an analog paper distribution product to a digital product, um, but we're ultimately going to, as we've been kind of visioning now for about 10 years, just some time to come that. So thank you. Questions for Mike? What kind of downloads are you getting on the new Topo maps? Thank you, I forgot to say that. I, I'm pretty impressed. When we started out, it was actually pretty low. We were probably, the digital map data, so I'm going to take a guess here, we're probably around maybe a thousand. Um, we're now up to about 4,000 a day. Oh, nice. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, my turn, I'm Connie Beard with the Census Bureau. I'm the Chief of the Cartographic Products Branch. Um, and I usually get to talk about maps and hold up pretty things and just talk about how we made them or why we made them. But I'm kind of handicapped because I don't have any pretty things to hold up or talk to today. So bear with me. So uh, I was asked to talk about trends in government from the Census Bureau perspective. And I had framed this several different ways, but this is my, my final go through. Uh, and I decided to, to mention some of the influences on how we um, face trends or how we decide what trends to follow. And it's, uh, it's influenced at the Bureau, I believe, uh, or un under a number of things. One of them is our mission, our culture, the policies that were uh, um, affected by the technology, of course, and then budget as well. So I want to talk about those things and, and talk to you a little bit about our culture of the Bureau to help you frame, help frame how we uh, approach trends in the industry. Um, our mission, of course, primarily is to, uh, we have a constitutional mandate to count 
and in the United States, at least every 10 years. And we do that to provide the information to the states so that they can um, draw their congressional districts for elections. Um, our culture uh, is framed by about four primary categories, I would say. One is quality, uh, innovation, uh, cooperation, and sharing. Um, from a quality perspective, I believe that one of our prime directives is to make sure that all the information that we collect and disseminate is as complete and accurate as possible. We take that very, very seriously. Um, in terms of innovation, the Bureau has always been very innovative. Uh, we innovate to improve our efficiency, try to make things um, um, cheaper and better as much as possible. Um, and we do that through a variety of um, steps. We evaluate ourselves constantly. We uh, do overall uh, operational evaluations as part of the census and surveys that we conduct. Uh, we're always doing lessons learned activities for ourselves and amongst ourselves. Um, we solicit input from academics, from scientists and other groups that um, work with us, for us, and advise us. We automate everything as much as possible. That includes the data collection, the data processing, the data dissemination. We have a lot to do, and so we try to automate that uh, to the greatest extent possible. <clears throat> it reduces our risks and helps us with our quality control. We're always trying to um, improve our operations. We, as part of our lessons learned and some of those other evaluative processes, we revise existing operations. We will even eliminate some along the way that have proven not to be so helpful or not as productive as we had hoped. And we implement uh, new operations along the way if technology or uh, to meet uh, user demands as needed. And we leverage new resources as much as possible. Um, and we love to do testing. We're a statistical agency, so we're, we're always testing everything that we do to be sure that it really meets the standards that we set for ourselves. Um, we, we cooperate. We're a cooperative organization. We partner with other federal agencies, USGS, USPS, um, tribal, state, and local governments to the greatest extent possible. Um, we do this to collect boundaries, features, feature names, and address information to conduct our censuses and surveys. Uh, we collaborate on operations and programs uh, for, two, uh, for a geographic area encoding, for geographic area naming, uh, for feature area and database standards, and uh, for emergency preparedness. And we also like to share. Um, if we've collected it, created it, processed it, or, or mapped it, and if it's appropriate and suitable for public consumption, then we'll reprocess it as needed and we'll try to share it with the public to the greatest extent possible. So that's how we sort of frame ourselves and how we conduct our business to the census. So we talk about trends and the trends that we are um, pursuing recently in any way. Um, when you say the word trends for me, it really almost translates to challenges. Um, I think about it in terms of um, then and now and how we do different, uh, do some of the same things but with different tools in a different fashion. And so when I think about uh, trends and challenges, I think about data quantity and the challenge that's presenting us uh, recently. The sheer volume of data is just increasing exponentially. Um, and I think that stems from the demands for better precision of our uh, tiger spatial data and also for the demographic data that we collect <coughs> the, to support more uh, support GPS, support geocoding, and, and even data exchange. There's more layers of data, there's more coordinates in the data, there's more attributes and uh, more relationships which means more interactions uh, and intersections to the various pieces of data. And it makes it a lot more difficult to process and manage this volume of data. So that's a big challenge for us right now. Um, even the concept of quality is becoming a challenge. Uh, I said we strive for completeness and accuracy, and it's becoming a little bit more difficult to really define what that really means in, in the now sense. Um, how precise should this data be? I mean, our Tiger database, I think we have accuracy and precision way um, in much uh, greater granularity than, we can, can it, than anyone could ever see on a map at any scale. Um, but we still have to keep that, we maintain that precision. It makes it more difficult. Um, and then on the flip side, what might be good enough or precise enough to conduct a census may not be so for public consumption for various, for any particular use. 
Uh, so for, it depends on what perspective you're coming from, what lo whether it's local level or national level, you know, especially for attributes as to what uh, level of quality you need to meet. Uh, one of the greatest, I would say, trends that is uh, changing the way we think about doing our business is our customer base. Um, in the past, we had a pretty well-defined customer base. We had our internal customers with the enumerators that we had to support in the data collection um, for the census and surveys. Um, we had states for redistricting. Congress was an important customer. Planners, analysts, academics, and of course GIS and mapping activities. Um, to put that into perspective, uh, in terms of enumerators, uh, keeping this is uh, keeping enumerators. Uh, they're providing the tools and enumerators needed. Um, that was a big part of our, our work. The 2010 census was supposed to be the paperless census, but my office uh, ended up writing software to produce uh, 18 million unique maps in about eight weeks. It was a completely automated system uh, that we needed to supply a pack of maps for enumerators to walk the streets in the uh, address canvassing operation across the nation. Something that we hadn't really counted on, but we had to pull it off at the very last minute. Um, but that said, as much pro uh, production as that was, our customer base now has expanded to even the general populace, John, the, the individual on the street holding their cell phone. Uh, they can stand on the corner now with a widget that the Census Bureau um, prepared. They can, they can learn what the population is for that particular census tract, even down to a block route how much value that really has for somebody, but they can do it. So the, so the trend really is, is to embrace the social medias and things like that uh, to bring census data to the, to the common person. Um, in terms of product, uh, for, again, uh, we, uh, that's a, something that's becoming a little more difficult for us to find um, than in the past. We knew what our data products were. We had traditional products. We created maps to conduct the census, and we created maps to accompany the data tabulations that went out after the census. Um, in terms of spatial data, we pretty much just repackaged the tiger data that we used to collect the census in a format that initially was our own format, kind of spawned a little tiny little uh, uh, service to translate tiger line data into something that was actually usable in a GIS system. But more and more, we're trying to um, format products that are much more user friendly. So now we offer a variety of different formats, even KML, some of them overlay on their um, Google map. So the product base is starting to expand um, as well. Um, technology. Uh, is always something that we try to look at to improve and enhance our, uh, our um, operations. And from our perspective, uh, it's the technology is, is volatile. When we, if you just think in terms of just the decennial census, we're already planning for the 2020 census, and we're trying to think, imagine what the technology might be available in 2020. Um, and it's almost an impossible uh, task to do so. We did a pretty good job, I think, the 2010 census. We did use handheld devices, but we, um, the data that we ended up putting onto the device was much more complex than the devices that we had procured could handle. So we have, a, it's a difficult challenge to be able to plan for exactly what technology is gonna be available five or six years in the future. Um, uh, in terms of human resources, the trend uh, in government and probably other places as well is, to, uh, is for shrinking resources. Um, in the past, we've had organizational structures that were what I call maybe structured specialization. We all had defined role, roles, but we're moving a little bit more towards loosely structured task-oriented teams because we're trying to take advantage of um, available resources across the organization. When they become available, we'll try to tap those, bring them into a team to get a specific task done. Um, it, it works for some things, but I'm not sure it's all that efficient way to, to do business, but we're still working for that, working through that. Um, and then media is a, is a trend that we're trying to get a handle on. That when, what we just talked about today, there's uh, all availability of many different kinds of media. There's still hard copy, that we support to a certain degree, digital maps, 
Um, we are releasing our spatial data in, in a um, uh, web map server and web feature server arrangement. We have, we're trying to support mobile apps, widgets, and there's the concept that we want to be able to support the um, individual user to get it now, get whatever kind of data, ask any question that they might want to have to get that single number whenever they need it. And that's a, that's a very difficult thing to support. So from the perspective of my discussion with this group today is that um, I don't know whether or not the Census Bureau can really support this broadening customer base and this broadening product base uh, with the resources that we have at the, at the present time. So I'd be very, very interested in knowing from this group you know, what you expect to get from your Census Bureau, from your government, uh, to support your work. And based on what I hear about that, you know, how we can work together to maybe direct customers that end, end up coming to the Census Bureau that we maybe cannot support and to be able to direct them to these resources here. So whatever dialogue we can come to with that, I'd be very interested in hearing. Questions for Connie? I'm Bill Craftsman. I'm here representing the Forest Service. Um, Forest Service is a fairly large federal agency. We've got 30,000 full-time employees, another 14,000, depending on what time of year it is, um, largely because of fire season. Uh, we manage around 191 million acres of ground in 155 forests, 20 grasslands, all that aggregated in nine regions. Um, from a geospatial perspective, we get a lot of management correction from our geospatial management office in the Washington office. But the fact is the information management programs in each of those regions is operating pretty much autonomously. What that means is they vary in functional capability and they vary in size from uh, one person in the case of Region 9, that's the area in the northwest, north, northeast United States, to uh, programs in the neighborhood of about 30 people in uh, Region 5, which is California. I'm from the southwest region. This is my home turf. Um, I have a staff of 16 employees, and we're one of the few regions that still maintain a full suite of mapping science capability. So what that means from our perspective is cartography, GIS, remote sensing, photogrammetry, spatial databases, and supporting IT technologies. Um, you know, when we look at what's going on in the world today in, in our specialty area, what we see is a river of technology flying by at a very fast pace. Some of the regions in the Forest Service have sort of stepped away from the bank. Others have stuck in a tow to get a sense of what the water's like. Um, my gang threw in a canoe, tossed me in the bottom, and the paddle went crazy for cents. Um, bailing like that so we don't get swamped. There's a lot of different technologies that we have the potential of using. The ones we selected are largely driven by customer interface. Uh, we spend a lot of time out on the ground with our customers, and there's basically two schools of customers for us. There's the people in the Forest Service that we serve, um, the range cons, foresters, etc. They're actually out there doing work on the ground. And then there's folks such as yourselves, the private industry people and our private sector customers, who are buying on our products. It's important to us that we're producing a product that meets needs of not only our internal customers, but also our external customers. And what we're hearing from both groups is that they want to see things uh, net-based, they want to see mobile applications, and they want to see them sooner than later. As a consequence, we've been working hard to modify our program and develop in that direction. Um, one of the first things we did was try to update the look and feel of our current flagship product, the Forest Visitor Map. Take a look at our booth, you can compare our old and new product. That's something people have been asking for for quite some time now. And then we also started stepping into the electronic arena. Um, one of our first steps was with FS Topo. The USGS folks are creating a product called US Topo. The Forest Service has a mandate to build topographic maps over the Forest Service ground, and our product is FS Topo. It's a web based, uh, database driven um, digital application producing digital topo clocks um, using our GIS technology. So Arc Server, Arc Now. Um, and what we have in that is a, uh, is a nationwide uh, seamless 
transactional database that we can derive real-time PDF maps from. Uh, we produce those internally for the Forest Service right now. This is web-based, so you can log into a website, pick any piece of ground in the Forest Service in the United States and produce a topographic map real-time. Um, we have not been distributing that to the public yet. We're starting now. GSTC, the Geospatial Services and Technology Center in Salt Lake, recently released that to the national libraries. And we're planning to release it to the public uh, this coming year. In my region, what we have done is produced a map kiosk environment so we can start selling those clocks to the public now. We have that demonstrated as well here today. Um, take a look at it if you're curious. We think the product is useful and we'd like to get some input. Um, beyond FS Topo, one of the things we're also working a lot on is web services, um, map services in particular. Um, we're doing that a lot with respect to our forest plan vision process. You know, a forest plan vision really needs to be an interactive process with the customers in the field and the forest service. One way to do that is to allow the customers to look at maps of the forest plan, uh, make real-time revisions to it, and give us that feedback over, uh, over an active map service. We're starting to put those sites up. Um, we also have a novel map editing site that we're in the process of creating. Uh, when we do our map updates, we often do field reviews, sometimes three cycles of field reviews. That process is expensive and time consuming, so we're in, the, we're in the early stages of putting up a map service now that will give us the capability to do an online field reviews with the course that the customer sets it themselves. What that means is that you'll be able to go to a website and look at a map that we're in the process of building, provide your comments, and feed those back to us directly. We'll reach a broader audience and uh, hopefully make a better product down the road. Another area we're looking at is the use of QR code. Um, it's been in, around for quite a while now, and we're thinking it, in fact, we are putting QR codes on our maps. Uh, we produce a product now called the Motor Vehicle Boost Map. Basically, it's a uh, simple line graphic that defines where you can and can't drive a vehicle on a national forest. Um, on our new forest visitor map product, you'll see a little QR code in the corner. If you uh, flash in that QR code, you can take it to a website where you can download our motor vehicle use map. That way, you not only have the standard Forest Service flagship map product, but you'll also have the travel management maps so that you know where you can and can't go. The reason we're not putting all that information on the forest visitor map is that the forest visitor map is in a three to five year map cycle. The uh, travel management maps, depending on conditions on the forest, can change in any and so they're updated. Um, mobile applications is also becoming something that's really key for us. You know, it's foolish in this day and age to be sending range cons, um, silviculturalists, wildlife managers out the field with a notepad and paper. There's any number of digital devices that they possibly could be using to collect data that would download directly into our natural resource databases. And so we're looking at developing mobile applications. We're in the process of putting them together right now for our wildlife specialists that will allow them to go out in the field, collect wildlife data, come back to the office, hook that up to a computer, and download directly into our wildlife database in Kansas City. Um, keeps a lot of erroneous information out of the loop, provides them with a fast way to update their data and, and a simpler and uh, less expensive way as well. And there are other applications that we can build into. One of the questions we've asked ourselves several times is uh, how should we be building these? On the Forest Service, we're heavily Windows based, so we're looking probably at Windows tablets. And you might think that would be just something like C Sharp as a development platform. But what we're looking at really is more likely to be HTML5, primarily because it's device independent. It gives us the ability to work on uh, Apple's, you know, iPads, on Androids, or Windows-based devices, depending on what may or may not be available over the next few years. Along with this, there's another challenge just that we face, and I'm going to think of them as opportunities. Um, one of them is co computer security. We've talked a bit about public-facing pages. One of the things the Forest Service is seriously concerned with is viruses getting into our databases and viruses getting into our systems and bringing us down. 
Um, we had an episode about five years ago, for example, where we picked up a worm and knocked out several thousand computers in the agency for about a week. Um, imagine we lost productivity and something like that. We can't afford for that to happen again. So external security has become a real issue to us. One of the other things we're facing is declining map sales and declining budgets simultaneously. One thing that a lot of people don't realize about the Forest Service is that our mapping program is, is only partly supported by appropriated dollars. Most of the money we use for mapping, and in turn, the salaries for my personnel in the shop actually come from map sales. So when you have a situation where map sales are falling and appropriated dollars are falling, falling that really puts a pinch on our programs. And uh, it's something that we're going to have to be dealing with. Currently in my shop, I have three positions I likely won't be able to fill at a time when I can really use digital development skills. Um, similarly, we have a corporate GIS system that has issues as well with the Citrix environment and an enterprise data system in, so, in, so, in uh, Kansas City. Uh, the problem we face with the Citrix environment is that it frankly doesn't work very well. Uh, there are days when it can take my analysts 30 to 40 minutes simply to get into the environment. Uh, that's very painful. One of the problems we have is that we don't know how fast or if we'll be able to fix that. And so as an agency, we're already looking at the next generation of capability. Um, because budgets are going down, um, succession planning becomes an issue. If you look across geospatial functions in the Forest Service, about half our personnel are eligible for retirement. Um, similarly, we don't have money for training. Um, so how do we stay current in a rapidly changing environment? Our software turns over about once every 18 months. It's very difficult to keep ourselves up to date. Um, along with that, something that I think is important to all of you is data maintenance. Um, in my shop, we have uh, 15 themes of corporate data running to about 60 or so feature classes. This is data that's used in any kind of mapping you can imagine, um, especially catastrophe and topographic mapping. It's information that many people can have for free. Um, it's available on our website. It's uh, collected quite a bit by a number of folks. The problem we have is maintaining that. When budgets go down, one of the first things that typically falls off the table is data maintenance. And keeping ourselves up to speed has become a real issue for us. Uh, similarly, data storage and archiving are in the same position. Uh, our photo program now is totally digital. The aerial photography for a single forest can be over a terabyte. Uh, right now in my shop, I have about 100 terabytes of data stacked up on hard disks in the basement. Um, the thought of losing that is really scary. Um, and finally, something that's big for us is rural connectivity. We're the forest service. We work in the woods. Um, if you look at the, the cities in New Mexico, Coyote, uh, Quimado, um, what else have we got? Uh, the north end of the Grand Canyon. Uh, these are places that are still served by copper wire. Um, the kind of connectivity that we look for from the internet and we look for from mobile applications isn't there yet and may not be for three or four years. But how do we serve those people with the technologies we have? All of these are opportunities that we're looking at now in our agency. So I think that's a fair introduction. If you have questions, uh, questions for Bill? Your uh, uh, seamless data triple data is national. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. Um, what's the scale? One to twenty-four thousand. How does that differ from what the U.S. uses? Um, in many ways, it's the same. Um, our standards are slightly different. Um, if you look at the map side by side, theirs has a photo database. Our photo database is optional. Um, it's a basic USGS topographic map with some simple changes. Um, the reason we do it is because we are mandated to do topographic mapping on Forest Service lands, not USGS. Um, anybody else? So, yeah, sure. I have a question from my hand for you both. So, um, you mentioned you're, you're experimenting with kiosks for, for printing these maps and selling them. And I assume that the kiosks have a printing capability. Is the USGS partnering with any printers or any, any sort of similar um, ways to print them? Do you guys have a partnership with printers or something or someone can do an idea of printing that? Or are there, are there plans for anything like that? Uh, <clears throat> the short answer is no. I know our Denver distribution is now looking at a way, looking at a contract to do the printing outside for the just-in-time printing. I think it's going to morph from there. I think that's 
just the first start of it. Um, but I have no plan right now to do it. Yeah. No, I'd like to make a comment about that. Like, you know, years ago we had a trade agreement with National Geographic and they had their map kiosks. And they had those, I think they had about 260 machines in various uh, sports stores, AEI, you know, AEI, and places like that. And uh, I think they've stepped back from that, Charlie. Are you guys still? No, it became a maintenance issue, keeping the software and the hardware and, uh, and the, the connectivity in uh, stores, because it was the rural ones. It just became you know, the, the, the cost. Absolutely right. We are uh, in the process of releasing the kiosk environments to our supervisors' offices. Um, we have computers available in the supervisor's offices. We can run on the printer. It's about twenty-five hundred dollars. Uh, we build the database in my shop and distribute it from my shop. So for us, the costs and maintenance are fairly limited at this point. Um, we would be happy to share this with other regions of the Forest Service if they decided to take it on. Capability internally in the geospatial program to deal with it. Some do, some don't. I mean, I don't have public private partnerships. Mm -hmm. It's not always as easy to set up from a government standpoint, but I know the USGS is doing some really interesting things. Are you, you know, when I hear things like printers, I mean, I, we do a lot of work with HP and others. Like I say, we're, we're razor blades, we make a lot of money on, on blades and shaping cream, et cetera. Concept has been uh, buy a printer, put it in an SO, and make maps. Bare bones. Um, we're printing on waterproof paper, selling for $10 a piece. Uh, we've had it operating in the regional office now for several months. Um, you know, we sell a few dozen maps here and there. Quad maps typically aren't a big seller for us. Um, but out in the districts, especially during hunting season, that's a different story. And so that's the market we're targeting right now, and we're trying to target it with off-the-shelf cost equipment. Um, so we really haven't made any, we really haven't tried to develop a relationship with HP, for example. Um, relative to volumes of maps out of FS Topo, we do have a printing contract with the Geospatial Service and Technology Center. So for example, if there was a fire someplace and they needed 100 copies of a given quad sheet, um, we could have those printed quickly. Any other questions for Bill? Thank you. I had to be the last to go. <laughs> My name is John Hanna. I work for the Bureau of Land Management here uh, in New Mexico. I work with the Santa Fe State Office. Um, as far as technology goes with uh, Bureau of Land Management's mapping, um, we manage the, the 100K mapping program. I'm sure you've all seen it on the ELM 100K. Uh, but we're fairly old school in our methodology. I mean, we still sell paper copy maps out of our field offices to our biggest clients, which are hunters, uh, recreation folks, uh, as well as uh, uh, oil and gas industry. So with that being said, um, there's a big push. Uh, I can't really speak that much for uh, the national level, but from what I understand is there's a big uh, push for web mapping services so that we can get more information to the public. Uh, in New Mexico, particularly, we have the uh, IT4M initiative that we're pushing. Uh, it's getting some national light. And uh, that whole concept is that uh, the GIS data that we dish out to the public and that we manage um, for internal decisions is being uh, uh, managed more and more by the resource specialists themselves. So if we're talking about oil and gas data or wildlife data, it's managed by the wildlife biologists and by the oil and gas engineers. Uh, rather than by GIS specialists. Um, and the reason that I mention that is uh, particularly when you combine that concept with the web mapping stuff, uh, members of the public and, and folks like you uh, can rest assured that the, the GIS data coming out of the BLM is going to be more accurate and updated more frequently um, if you guys do use it in uh, your individual mapping applications. Um, that's not all the data. I mean, there's some data that we manage um, 
that we can't necessarily uh, get out to the public, uh, in particular law enforcement or uh, cultural information. But most of the data that, uh, that we do manage is uh, publicly available to everyone. Currently, it's mostly just downloadable from our each individual state and field office levels. Um, but we're seeing uh, big trends with uh, SDE technology and replicating data up from the field offices who are, like in the case of the Forest Service, are in very rural areas that don't necessarily have good network connections. And uh, as we migrate that up to state office levels and up to the national levels, um, what we're seeing is that um, the data is getting better and it's uh, getting out into the hands of more people. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the 100K mapping program. That's primarily why I came uh, and was invited. Uh, I manage it for the state of New Mexico. It's a national um, mapping uh, program, but uh, I manage it for uh, New Mexico. And um, like I said earlier, it's pretty old school. Uh, we still sell paper copy maps. I've talked quite a bit with um, Bill Jackson, who is the, um, he, managed, he managed the program nationally uh, out of our National Operations Center. And uh, I've pushed this idea of QR barcodes on there to them, you know, that, um, that people need to be able to access these maps digitally from an iPad or from an iPhone, um, as well as the hard copy. Um, and for the BLM in particular, we have uh, roots in a lot of different um, arenas uh, as far as resources go, from uh, oil and gas to uh, range. And I mention those two because um, could you imagine a rancher on a horse out there in the field, uh, you know, herding his cattle, trying to use an iPad to look at the stuff? But I know that a lot of them do have iPads and they do use them. So the idea there is that we, for BLM at least, we need to keep that paper map copy available. Um, I know it comes under fire quite a bit um, in our particular agency uh, as something that is not necessarily needed anymore. Um, but I think that, uh, like with the other agencies, uh, it's, it's vital that we keep uh, paper copies um, out there as well as um, continuing to push for these, these new trends. And um, BLM does have a Facebook page. I don't know how many likes we have. I've never even looked at it, so. But, Did you, you feel left out? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's pretty much all from, from the BLM. Questions for John? So this is kind of a question for, for all of you. So, you know, um, you just mentioned, um, you know, looking at, at mobile apps and, and mobile, you know, there's tablets, there's phones, there's all this, these new devices. Several of you, and Bill mentioned this, Tom mentioned it, um, you know, several of you mentioned working more with mobile devices, the need for working with mobile devices. Are you getting, I guess, is there, are there limitations you're running into with these about the not being able to be connected to issues and things like that. But are there, are there things you're running into with these that are maybe not <coughs> difficult to implement? Is it, is it something you guys are planning on going forward with just throughout government? Is it, uh, I imagine a lot of your customers are asking for them. That's why I'm, I'm kind of asking the question. Well, I can answer real quickly for the, the BLM. Uh, one of our biggest hurdles is, is IT around. Um, as soon as you mentioned opening up, these web maps to the public and letting them, you know, get into our networks and all this other stuff. Um, it, it definitely throws up a lot of red flags. So, but um, like Bill had mentioned about the, the Forest Service, um, one thing um, with the, the BLM is we're very separated as far as um, our field offices. They, they're very autonomous from each other. Um, so like in Mexico right now at our state office, we're, we're putting things on ArcGIS online, uh, whether or not Washington frowns on it, you know, we're, we're trying to get stuff out there um, and, and available um, to, to more people to view. Um, but that's one of our biggest hurdles is, is that um, security issue. Um, we, we do have challenges and I think that uh, IT is one of them. We're already exposing Tiger as a Tiger Man service and 
maybe Tiger Beach or service, if not right away, be out there pretty soon. Um, but we, there, in terms of mobile apps per se, um, there's kind of two directions that we're going. We have the, our public information office people that are trying to use mobile apps just to expose, like I tried to um, explain, just census data to the common person. Um, I'm not really sure what the value is in that. And, so, and what happens is that that activity is really generating more product, uh, more uh, need for product that's coming from the same resources that are trying to build Tiger, conduct our internal mission um, activities and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a little bit of a resource drain in, in my personal opinion. This is definitely just me talking at the moment, but I'm not really sure that's the best use of resources. But on the flip side of that, we did use, as we use the handheld device in the 2010 census, we're trying to pursue that as well. And I think the biggest challenge is trying to be able to, to plan and, and be able to develop the tool or the functionality that we'll need to have on those devices, not knowing what that device or instrument or will be. So, so that's huge. I'm not really sure how we can even approach that. That's what I'm like this challenge. So just a kind of a follow-up question. So we, um, so we produce a value-added product. So I work at Esri. We produce business analysts online, which consumes all of that demographic information from the census. And we go through and process it in a number of different ways and come up with our own category kind of structures for demographics of, of a particular area. We have our own mobile app where you can go on and, and wherever you're at, see you know, the, the kind of age ranges. And, and there's a huge amount of, of value in it for all sorts of businesses, all sorts of um, you know, people interested in, in marketing or selling to specific demographics. And, and we've actually been able to use that data a lot for that purpose. It's actually one of our perspective, I'd like to be able to direct that to sure. you guys so that we can concentrate more on, on building the, the data to support that. Can I give you some time? Sure. To be sure that we can make that as complete and as accurate and as authoritative as possible. <coughs> from the USGS side, and from me personally, um, taking the US turbo to a mobile device is important. I've had it in a research project for our research group for a couple of years now to look at. And unfortunately, for budgetary reasons, it keeps getting kind of cut. One of the things I want to do is be able to take it out for the scientists to use so they can use the base information to create their science, take it back in the office, and not have to redo it again. The two things I think we're going to, well, three things I think we're going to find. One is file size. Right now, as we continue to, to add data to the product, the file size keeps pushing it down, but that's what we keep fighting that one. So a way to be able to transmit the data quickly, um, whether, so the format's another one, whether the PDF format is the right format for a mobile device, I still have a question on that. I don't know if that's what the true answer is. And the third one would be the layering. How do you then get the product out there with the layers that can be open so that the scientists can do the work without creating specific, you know, layered products for each individual science community. And there are probably others out there that are not aware of. I'd like to just make a couple comments about mobile devices themselves. You know, especially in our business, the natural resource business, where you're out in bright sunlight. Um, most of the mobile devices that are available today have screens that aren't bright enough to work effectively in that environment. I mean, I, I suspect many of you have been outside on a really bright, sunny day and taken a look at your cell phone and not been able to see anything. Um, that doesn't work for somebody who's trying to collect rain data out in the middle of Arizona. Um, another problem is battery life. Um, iPad has an eight-hour battery life. That's roughly field day. But often when field days start at six in the morning, and end at eight or nine at night, and they do sometimes, especially for wildlife people, it's not enough. Um, there are mobile devices that have interchangeable batteries, but then you swap the batteries in the field. So that can be a little problematic too. Um, we believe the devices are 
we light up the cusp of being ready for prime time. We'd like to see brighter screens. We'd like to see longer battery life. Any other questions for the panel? Over here. Uh, yeah, recently uh, Ralph Nader's watchdog group kind of ripped into the government printing office for producing products that were really only accessible by, by the internet. And what they cited was about 19 million Americans who still don't have access to high speed internet, and about 50 million Americans above the age of 20 who still don't regularly use the internet. Now, in my mind, that's roughly 20% of the population. Have these issues been addressed or bounced, bounced around? Yeah, unfortunately, that's a very hard one. And I guess from my perspective, I wish I could print them out. I wish I had the budget to be able to do that. I'm producing 18,000. There's no way I can do it. The only feasible way for my organization to exist is I'm making is to take it through digital. So yes, it's a problem. I understand it. I don't know what the solution is to that. Other comments? You know, we, we recognize that as well, and, and that's part of the reason that we're setting up the mass map kiosk environment in our SOs. Um, sometime next year, our, our FS Topo products will be available online to the public. But in places where the public can't get online, a lot of our public communities at least have the option of going into one of our supervisor's offices and acquiring the cartography there. Uh, and we have no intention of getting out of the forest visitor in that business anytime soon. Um, the other thing I'll say is that I believe that there's so much momentum and the perception that, uh, based on the, the social media presentation, there that so many such a great percentage of us are online, but there is that perception, there is that momentum that to keep up the government, just like business, to keep up, you have to be online, you have to be digital, you have to be this, you have to be that. So, again, I'm, this is just me talking, but I believe because of that, partly because of that, um, the, the paper community or those that only, can only rely on that, you know, are a smaller group. You know, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, you know, we, we've had a discussion for a number of years about that portion of the population that's just where they're at, and then we need to be able to get them with more creative means because we are your government. And those 20 percent, and that's 60 million Americans. Uh, you know, that's important. Uh, the government has to address that with shrinking budgets. It's probably more innovative approaches, partnering with people in this room to get to them. You know, if we provided the digits or digital data in a PDF business opportunity to provide it to a paper format or get it to that community. Uh, we need to be more creative in partnerships and meeting that. That's, you know, that's not going to change as quickly as people think, because I've been talking about that for five years, about that group that's not being served as we transition. Uh, and we don't have all the answers. Charles, you have? Well, it's, just, it's just an interesting, and you have budgetary restrictions and then content. Uh, you mentioned uh, you'd really like to concentrate on creating the best data or gathering but it's an accessibility that you're all you all mentioned that at one point. It's like we have this great stuff and it's an accessibility. And I'm looking at it from a publisher or public standpoint because it's some of the stuff's easier to get hacked than others. Um, but you know, uh, the speaker this morning, you know, he held up uh, Joe held up the phone a moment. We said, just look, this is another publishing platform because sometimes we make mobile apps, etc. It's like a scary new universe, but the reality is, you know, it's about the data and the content. What, what I find is interesting too, though, and I've seen this transition, and I don't have an answer, is when we started creating websites back in the mid-90s, um, you created for the lowest common denominator, right? You had to make sure everyone could access it, whoever had the smallest computer, the slowest, the slowest uh, you know, access or, or dial-up time. But it's kind of the complete opposite now. You don't create, at least in the public, in the private sector, we don't create for the lowest common denominator anymore. We create for what's going to happen six months from now and the burden's back on the public to say, well, you can't get our stuff to <coughs> upgrade your software or your, your device. And it's just an interesting you know, switch. You have an advantage <laughs> that to as a, as a public agency, but it's, just, I, it's, it's a really tough, tough question. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess along with that, uh, last year in February, I was up in Alaska when we were 
trying to kind of figure out what we're going to do up there in regards to a product, what scale, what data, what the whole thing. And when we talked about the GOPDF, to be honest, I actually got a lot of praise on that, you know, simply because there is no connectivity in a large in parts of the world up there, of the area. What they would do is just carry from CD to CD or flash drive or friend to friend. Or, so they, they were perfectly okay with it. I think you're right that within our, uh, with the, at least in the Census Bureau, we do still have to service the lowest common denominator. So for our programs that we, for which we uh, reach out to uh, local governments and that sort of thing to collect data boundaries, features, and that sort of thing, we still make a lot of paper maps to do that. But in terms of the data dissemination, um, we're not doing as much printing as we used to do. It's mostly PDF digital. So that's why I'd kind of like to, to know from this group, you know, how, how we could partner with you guys to do more of that perhaps. But it maybe sounds like this group is not doing so much of that either, I'm not really sure. There's a quick, sorry to keep asking questions. There's a question that someone asked this, or I think Joe asked this, this morning, is there a correlation between digital, more digital products versus print products? And, you know, we all have different stories. I can just tell you that it helps to have our brand in National Geographic, but the more our content from the map standpoint and products are out in a digital format, whether it's on the, on the web or on mobile apps, you know, the more print maps we're selling. And it's, you know, it's hard to make a direct correlation, but certain product lines, like our, our Trails Illustrated sort of backcountry maps, there, there seems to be a, a real correlation because it's not, in some cases, like hiking in the backcountry, it's not an either or. It, it truly is an answer. So like you said, you want to win your battery goes, or you drop it, drop this device in the, in the river or creek. But, um, so we've actually seen an uptick in our print side. Um, but, but very selected lines, you know, some Charlie, but could that be because they're not doing it? Uh, possible, possible, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, you know, North, I'm from Washington, up in Washington State. Very hard to find North Cascades maps other than yours up there, National Park. So I do, is it because they're not doing it and you're taking up that spot because it's not found out there? I don't know. So some people probably. Are you speaking about a topographic map? Sorry? Are you talking about a topographic map in North Cascades? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if it's on national forest land, um, the implementation and utilization of FS Tom varies from region to region, as do the geospatial programs. Um, so it's possible that in Region 6 they haven't concentrated on it in the same way we have. So I, I'm not surprised to hear that. I just, I just think that's okay. Were there other questions that the panel had about the membership here that you would like to take away from this? I have a question about uh, digital archiving, especially from the from Library of Congress perspective. If we collect everything, or if we collect more in ebooks and PDF and that sort of thing, do, do you have a concern that in how you'll maintain the access to those, given the fact that even PDF formats change dramatically from revision to revision? Uh, definitely there's a concern, and that's why I guess we've been, in a way, moving so slowly. The, uh, the formats will change. Uh, uh, that, that's why we've, we've, up until now, tended to stay with the, the, the by far, uh, our, our, uh, the known format that we knew how to handle would be a hard copy, so we've been very resistant to, uh, to, to venture away from that. But I think the reality is, is uh, I think every one of these government agencies represented here at this table is looking at, at flat or, or shrinking budgets for the uh, foreseeable future. Um, we've seen a, a reduction in just my division of 48% in the last uh, 12 years or so. So uh, we, we are venturing into areas where we, we, we don't have a lot of expertise sometimes, but I, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a necessary uh, uh, direction that we have to head in. This. Um, Obviously, the, the, the numbers of uh, e-books that are being published in, in, in publishers, uh, quite frankly, are, are only publishing in an electronic format. So, I mean, it's not like we, we have much of a choice. But uh, yes, there are definitely concerns about how, how we are going to maintain access to to, uh, to these type of uh, type of formats in the future. Any other questions from any of the panel members? 
to each other or the audience? Well, I want to thank the panel uh, this afternoon. It's been a long afternoon, but uh, appreciate the energy and everyone staying and participating. And again, uh, let's give the uh, panel a round of applause.